Okay, so I know that I said that we'd be jumping into Unreal uh, with our pathfinding algorithm, but there is actually uh, one more thing that we need to do inside Houdini uh, before we go to Unreal. And that is we need to uh, set up the terrain uh, that uh, Ian has created uh, in his workshop. Uh, and we need to sort of have sort of this shared uh, kind of source of ground truth that's going to exist uh, outside of Unreal or between Unreal and Houdini. And the reason we want to do that is so that we can sort of set up all the costs and attribute what attributes once uh, without constantly needing to send the whole terrain from Unreal back to Houdini. So uh, in the project files that I provided, you should find uh, the final result of uh, Ian's workshop. And what we're going to do is we're just going to use a file node. Uh, we're going to go and import that final result that Ian created. So here is the terrain. And then we're going to do the processing of this terrain into the format that our pathfinding tool expects. Now, of course, we could wire this in directly to the prepare pathfinding mesh uh, node that we've created. We haven't actually created a digital asset yet, so we'll do that quickly too. Uh, but you're, what you'll quickly notice is if we wire in uh, Ian's high resolution uh, terrain that he's created, we're going to see that our pathfinding mesh tool is going to take absolutely ages to try and mesh this all to sort of convert it to geometry and then to mesh it into triangles uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a slightly quicker way of taking this volume this height field volume and turning it into sort of a triangulated mesh for the pathfinding so let's escape out of this process here there we go it took a little minute and because I want to avoid accidentally cooking that again, uh, when I enter, when I dive inside of the subnetwork there, I'm just gonna set the update mode to manual. So we have our uh, remesh method and convert height field. And this is kind of like, I suppose, your typical way of converting a height field into uh, geometry. Uh, but there's another way that I'm going to show you here uh, that I found that I think is perfectly fine for our UK use case and quite a lot faster. Okay, so I can turn back on uh, auto update or on mouse update now. So we're going to abuse the fact that we don't really care about any sort of aspects of our geometry or topology, except for the fact that we have relatively even, even sized triangles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and put down a height field scatter. And let's have a look at what we get out of the box. And we get this sort of like pile of points. And it took a little while. It was already a lot quick. We can make this go even faster. We just go and turn off relax points. There you go. See, almost instantly, we get this uh, field of points now across our terrain. And uh, another thing that we can consider is that we don't actually need to be pathfinding across the whole terrain. We can completely discard all of these areas off of the island. They're going to be outside of the water. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a height field mask by feature. And what you'll notice is we don't actually see the result of this mask yet. And that's because we're currently visualizing the color. Uh, that's just how uh, Ian's height field is coming in with the colors being visualized. So we can overwrite that with our height field visualize and we can say no change to the material, but we want to make sure the tinting by layer is set to default tinting. There we go. And we're just going to do a mask by height with a linear ramp. Okay. I might actually change that to a smooth ramp. And I may pull up the bottom. So there we go. We're just isolating the actual island. And then I'm going to do a quick little height field mask blur. There we go. I'm going to set this to 100. So there we go. We're now getting a soft fall off around our island. And if we plug this mask into the second input of the scatter, you're going to see that we now get sort of this gentle fall off of points around the island, uh, which is already starting to look pretty nice. But we can go ahead and actually just completely cut off those points that are below a certain threshold. Um, if we go ahead and do blast and then say at p dot y is less than let's just try zero for a bit to begin with okay that got rid of some but we can't really see it so let's try five or three or even two there we go okay so now we're just cutting off everything uh that sort of like you know not uh not just directly at the bottom of those cliffs there so this is part way there, um, but uh, you can see that we're getting uh, just points. We're not getting triangles. And then the other issue is that we're getting lots of points of sort of, they're not evenly spaced. So in order to ensure that, ensure that we have even spacing between our points, I'm going to put down a fuse node and I'm going to set the snap distance to five, which is five meters. 
And if we plug that in now, you see that we get this nice evenly spaced point grid or field of points, it's not really a grid. And then finally, the key to the whole trick is we're gonna use a triangulate 2D like so. I'm gonna set the mode to be select projection plane, which is automatically going to be in the Y, that is the up direction. And you can see now very quickly that's generated a mesh for us. And the last step is going to be to just project that back to our terrain. So we use ray, we're gonna use project ray in the direction of a vector, which is going to point straight up. And this is looking pretty good. So we've got a nice triangulated terrain mesh. Uh, the last thing that I wanna get rid of is these very large uh, primitives around the edge. Uh, we don't want to keep hold of those. So we can use a measure and we can set the measure mode to perimeter. And then we can just say, we want to delete primitives where the perimeter is greater than 100. And there we have a beautiful uh, height field mesh uh, that's been converted to a navigation mesh. And if we still see some large triangles around the edge, we can go ahead and try and reduce this further. 25 is too much, 50, 75 maybe, maybe we're just happy with 100 like we see there. Okay, so now if we wanted to have a denser sort of field for navigation, we can go back up to our fuse and we can set the snap distance to three meters. There we go. And you can see that still took a little minute to think, but it's much, much faster than if we were to do um, the, uh, the remesh over on the left there. So we can go ahead and maybe uh, if I just actually put this inside of a little null, null, and then I can go ahead and action collapse the subnet and we'll call this uh, create nav mesh. And if you want to prove to yourself that it's faster than the remesh and the convert height field, I encourage you to use the performance monitor and just try both approaches. But I'm sure you that this is a lot quicker and perfectly adequate topology for a pathfinding algorithm. Okay, so now that we've done that, uh, we can of course wire our terrain into our uh, calculate costs down here. And let's have a little look what we get. Okay, so we can see that we're now getting our result from the uh, height field mask and the slump. And uh, just like we did before, we can't actually see the masks over here, so it might be nice to, to see them. So we're gonna put down a height field visualize. I'm gonna make sure that that's set to default tinting. And now we can see the result we get from our slump. Uh, and because the resolution and size of the terrain is quite different to what we were dealing with before, we may want to just go ahead and modify some of these parameters to ensure that we get the result we're looking for. Okay, so there's our slump result, and uh, we no longer need the remesh there. Uh, we could combine this with the flow field, and I'm sure that we will want to at some point. Uh, as you can see, this gives us a really nice uh, result too. But for the time being, we're just going to stick with, I'm just gonna rearrange this graph a little bit. There we go, move this over here, move this over here. We're just going to stick with what we've currently got. Uh, this kind of processing uh, to generate some sort of basic costs across the terrain. And let's have a look too at the curvature and see what we're getting there. We can see that that's also going to be giving us some nice useful uh, information to help improve the quality of our pathfinding. So we've now uh, got a terrain mesh, uh, which has the costings uh, that we need or the attributes that we need to perform our cost uh, cost analysis on for the pathfinding algorithm. Uh, so we can have a little look. There's a whole load of other attributes that we don't really care about. So really we should be cleaning those up too, but we're not gonna worry about it right now. Uh, the most important thing that we want to check is that we have our costs, cost, uh, cost attributes. Oh, sorry, no, not our cost attributes, our attrib cost there. Uh, we have our concavity and we have our convexity. Okay, so those are going through and all of the slope kind of logic is just done directly inside of the pathfinding. So we're in a really good position now. And what I wanna do as sort of a last sort of step here is just to sort of really stress test this tool inside of Houdini and see what kind of pathing we can get 
uh, across this actual real kind of world uh, example of a terrain. So let's go ahead and just apply uh, a blank color to the terrain so it's a little bit easier to see what's going on. And let's just redo that kind of visualization setup that we had before. So make sure that I'm lifting up the paths by one unit as well so they're slightly more visible. I'm gonna get rid of those user curves that we had earlier and we're gonna create some new user curves there. And let's do sort of a realistic example of what pathfinding might be, of what kind of paths we might want to do. So we're gonna say, let's go from here to here, maybe up the terrain. Uh, we go, and if you find that you're not clicking very well, it's helpful sometimes to go to uh, the orthographic view. And uh, then I'm kind of happy with that. So I'm gonna start drawing another curve, starting over here. Okay, going up to this mountain as well. Okay, and then let's do one more kind of over here and just pay attention to how uh, responsive this tool is. Uh, even though, you know, we're pathfinding across this whole terrain, uh, everything is still very snappy, very fluid uh, and just working really well. And uh, at any point I can click on a path and go ahead and sort of extend off in a new direction uh, and very sort of quickly and easily uh, define these kinds of uh, waypoints uh, that are going to be used for sort of like modifying the terrain, maybe scattering some assets uh, and just generally sort of maybe even sort of doing level design tasks like sort of designing the flow through the world. And then uh, we have our basic setup, but right now the costs aren't really doing anything. So let's just turn up the ascent cost a little bit to get slightly wigglier paths, turn up the descent cost a little bit too. And if there are any areas that you're unhappy with, you can of course go in and sort of modify uh, those original waypoints to sort of give a slightly nicer character to your terrain and uh, maybe connect up different points like so. And uh, yeah, just kind of work with the tool uh, until you're happy with the result you get. I'm just gonna go ahead and give myself some concavity cost as well, because uh, I like the effect when the paths sort of wiggle their way across bridges. I think that gives a very realistic sort of man-made looking uh, kind of uh, style to those paths. Okay. So these are kind of the substitutes for what are going to be the sort of the main causeways, the main pathways that the player would use in the environment. Uh, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put down another pathfinding node off to the side here. And what this one's going to do is it's actually going to find a completely different set of paths. Uh, and for this one, I want to simulate the effect of uh, a lot of sort of maybe animals uh, that are moving across the terrain. So I don't really want to hand place these paths. I want to use a more procedural approach. So let's wire in the just tidy up the graph a little bit here, there we go. So in this case, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to scatter a bunch of points on our terrain. We're just gonna reorganize the graph a little bit there. Um, maybe add a little waypoint to there so that it's a little bit easier. And yeah, so we're going to do a little scatter. Okay, so we're just getting some points and you could be a little bit more careful about the scatter, sort of choosing where you want your scatters to be, like maybe on top of ridges or in valleys as opposed to just uniformly everywhere. We're going to do a second scatter. I'm going to set both of these to about 50 points and we're going to change the seed on the second one. There we go. So we have two different scatters now. And uh, what we're going to do this time is we're going to add a primitive from each scatter to each other scatter. So we can just use connect adjacent pieces. I'm going to say adjacent points and we can go ahead and do a little merge of these two points and we can set the radius to be 100. In fact, you know, we only need one scatter point, so let's do this. Let's try this first. Set the distance to be 1,000, okay? So we've created this network. Um, let's maybe go down to 25. So we've created this ed edge network here. We could try 500, so we're not just connecting everything up. Um, okay, yeah, 600 perhaps. There we go. So this looks like a nice network that's not too dense. Um, you could also try doing the triangulate 2D, as I showed you previously if you wanted to. So this will just give you, uh, in fact, let's go Let's go with this. This is probably gonna work a bit better. Um, and then uh, I'm just gonna make sure that we split this up uh, into just the, the, only the polylines, there we go. Now I know nothing about the directions of these primitives currently, so I'm very intrigued about the kind of result we're gonna get. And um, so let's just wire this in directly. And what's the issue there? When going from each start to each corresponding end, the number of start points and end points must be equal. So, okay, we need to process this slightly more. And this probably gives us a clue about how we can improve our, our tool. 
and there we go. So I used a convert line and this just ensured that um, our primitives make slightly more sense. So I think what the what the triangulate to DNs was doing was sometimes the primitives were a bit longer and they were sharing points and convert line just ensures that every single edge is its own primitive and that's what we want for the pathfinding. So that gives us a nice sort of organic and procedural looking result there. And if I just combine this and layer it with the original result, so we're gonna put down a merge. In fact, yeah, we'll put down a merge and uh, we'll actually make sure all the paths kind of get moved up a little bit so they're a bit more clear. And we'll look there. We can see that we've got our colored man-made paths and we've got our sort of uh, procedurally generated paths as well. And just to ensure that the animal kind of tracks or you know procedurally generated paths give us a slightly different um, kind of character and appearance, I'm gonna go ahead and say these ones don't prefer the ridges, they actually prefer valleys. There we go. So now they're doing something a little bit different to the, to the man-made paths. Um, and uh, right now neither is really using the, the user attribute cost, which is this, um, which is the, uh, it's not this concavity, it's actually the one where we're kind of visualizing the slump. So it's this. So maybe what I should do as well is for one or the other of those paths, bring in a bit of slump of that avoidance there, see what happens. Okay, that's, that's quite interesting. And um, so now you can see that they're sort of rooting around the cliffs and avoiding those slopes uh, a little bit. And maybe maybe I'll do the same for the, uh, for the, for the man-made paths as well. So let's have a little look. You can see the difference, zero. Well, for the man-made paths, it doesn't seem to be making a whole load of difference. Oh, it does actually change some areas a bit more than others. Okay. All right, so now let's go and increase the number of these uh, procedurally generated paths. And uh, if you find that things are getting a little bit too slow for you, we can go back into the prepare pathfinding mesh, create nav mesh, and let's just go and change that fuse distance back to five. And then we'll, uh, we'll let this run again once more. Okay. So now we've got some uh, man-made paths. We've got some uh, sort of procedurally generated, more organic looking tracks crisscrossing the terrain. And the last thing that we want to do, um, just to really show uh, once for all how flexible uh, this system is, um, we can go ahead and sort of simulate some rivers. And this one's gonna require us to do something a little bit uh, funky, but similar to something we did before. So once again, we're going to do a little scatter and uh, whereas this scatter is kind of happening sort of pseudo randomly across the terrain, we actually maybe want to focus the scatter points in this particular region, say sort of higher up on the slopes. So let's increase the amount here so we can see what's happening a bit more easily. Uh, and then let's go ahead and we're saying it's already generating by density, by density attribute. And we can set this density attribute to be anything that we want it to be. And uh, let's go ahead and set it to be mask. And then let's just go as well and just go and make sure that uh, our mask attribute is kind of grabbing the areas that we want it to be grabbing. So let's have a quick little look. Um, we can go ahead and create this mask attribute. So let's go with um, attribute ramp or ramp. Is there a way to do that? Um, What's the easiest way? We can maybe do, just do a color actually. So we're gonna do color and we're going to go ramp from attribute or ramp uh, from attribute, yeah. And then let's go and find height if we do actually have the height or position. Oh, there is a height in here, isn't there? There we go, it's height. So we've got our height. Um, then we've got our different height values. So these are coming straight from the terrain and we can sort of isolate this in to where where we want the, the scatter to be happening. So that looks pretty good to me. And then let's actually go with CD as the density attribute, just straight, nice and straightforward. And there we can see that we're now getting those points on the, uh, the tops of those uh, mountains. Let's decrease the number a little bit, though having quite a few isn't such a bad thing. And then uh, if you remember before, right, right at the start, when we just added a single point kind of at the world origin, uh, that's what we're doing here, just add a single point we've got our scatter points, then what we can do is essentially 
uh, we can do a pathfinding algorithm from each of these points to the world origin. But whereas before we just added a path directly from the points to the origin, what we're going to do this time is we're going to extend our terrain mesh so that uh, actually the border of the island uh, is every point is connected to that origin point. So that means that from every part of the island, uh, there's a route to this point, which means that from every point on the island, it can just pick the shortest route down to the sort of the water and then to that point. So let's go ahead and sort that out. Uh, what we need to do is gr create a group first of all. Um, and there's a labs, a labs tool for this. So we can go unshared, fast group unshared. Okay, so it's gonna fast group unshared on that terrain geometry. We can see that it's already grabbed all the points we want. And it's created a group called unshared. And if we then go and do a wrangle, uh, we can run over that unshared group. We can make it uh, have the, the second input be that single point there in the kind of the middle of the island. And then we can say, add prem as we did before uh, on geometry zero of type polyline from the current uh, yeah from the current point number to a target point and that target point is going to be uh, it's going to be oh yeah these, these these are actually positions aren't they so v at p no 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 they are points <laughs> my apologies um, now I have to rewrite it now because I'm a fool so we're going to go add prim uh, zero polyline and then at pt none and then we're going to go to a target point and then this point is going to be in point we're going to add the point and we need to add a point to geometry zero at a specific position that's what i needed to do and then vector pause is going to be equal to the attribute uh, on the second input p so that's position of point zero and then that's going to add these polylines uh, which go from every point on the border of the island to the point in the center so they can all be they can all reach there uh, and then finally uh, we're going to uh, wire this in to our uh, pathfinder so we need to make a new pathfinder uh, only this time it's going to take in our modified geometry like so um, and just actually make it a little bit more visible what's happening we can go and do uh, an end uh, um, open so you can see that we actually just it's all just edges uh, even though it's really not that much easier to see what's going on hopefully it's a little bit easier to see what's going on and then uh, for the we're actually going to do this very same thing we did before so this time we grab our scatter points and we get our add as well so it's the exact same logic only this time we don't need the group unshared so it's saying we are connecting all these points on the mountains to the center point so that's where we're trying to reach and then we're going to navigate across this terrain mesh so let's plug it in and see what we get all right and uh there we have it now it might be uh it might be that that took a little while for, for it to cook on your end but hopefully already you can see some cool stuff um what we're going to do just before we commit to this is we're going to play a little bit with the parameters and in order to do that um, we're also going to dramatically reduce the number of points down. So there we go. Okay, so let's have a little look at what we're dealing with. So we have our terrain uh, points. In fact, let's go ahead and do a little nice preview like we've done previously. So I'm going to grab the uh, incoming geometry. I'm going to merge that. I'm going to then add our river. And we're going to set the color to be a nice blue. So we can see that it is indeed water. There we go. Okay. So what's happening is that the point is being placed directly on this mountain. And then we're creating an edge that connects the point to that point at the origin of the world. And then uh, we also are modifying the terrain navigation mesh so that it has a way to get from that edge to that center at every point. And then let's have a little look. We can see that we get a path down to the edge here. Now it's doing something a little bit weird in that it sort of seems to be going to this point right here. Um, and I think the reason for that is because it is currently considering uh, the distance as an important cost. So this is just one more modification that we want to go ahead, go ahead and make to our pathfinding is we want to be able to weight the distance to be zero. So instead of, um, instead of sort of finding these weird routes, it's just gonna go straight down. 
Um, but uh, naturally, if we're talking about rivers, uh, then we don't want there to be any descent costs. So we can bring that down to zero. Uh, in this case, it doesn't seem to have made any difference. Um, the ascent cost, on the other hand, should be very high uh, because we don't want the paths to be able to go uphill. Uh, we can also turn off the convexity cost and we can also turn off the user attribute cost. So now what we can see is that we're getting sort of the most direct route down to the water. And if I just change the seed to get some different rivers, you can see that we're getting another one over here and we're getting another one over here. And very strangely, it sort of seems to be working, but at the same time, uh, they do all seem to be going down to the same exact point. So I'm not entirely sure why that would be. So I'm just gonna very quickly, uh, I'm gonna get rid of this ends in case that's messing things up. I'm gonna do a quick little fuse as well to make sure the geometry is all connected. And there, I think that was the, the secret there is that I needed to make sure that the primitives were connected properly. So now if we go ahead and increase the number of these points, we're gonna see that as we increase them, we get more of these paths that are sort of rooting down towards the rivers. And then if I can turn off the ascent cost. You're gonna see we just get the shortest possible path. It's not what we want. If I turn up the ascent cost somewhere really high, it's basically forbidding it from going uphill. So it's gonna take slightly longer routes um, in order to avoid going uphill. I could really mess with things if I added a ascent cost which is just going to cause uh, <laughs> cause it to take the most flat possible paths across the terrain. So it's not very believable to like a, an actual river. And um, so we want that to basically cut across these paths like so. Uh, you would probably also want to do, to introduce some custom uh, costs. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe if you remember we were doing the flow simulations before, so we could go ahead and actually add that as a cost um, if we wanted to. So remember the pathfinding algorithm expects to have a cost related, uh, a cost called attrib cost. So let's go ahead and add a new one just for the river for pathfinding. So we're gonna go ahead and actually operate on our height field again. Go height field visualize. We want a default visualization. Okay, I'm gonna do a height field flow field like we did before. I'm gonna set it to smooth. Okay, so this is like quite a useful um, guide to have for our rivers. We don't want it to be like a hard rule because we want it to be able to sort of skip across some of these regions, but it should at least cause the rivers to sort of follow the flow lines a little bit more than an attempt to cut across the ridges. Uh, if you remember in our prepare for finding mesh, uh, we have the uh, this attrib wrangle, which passes the costs. So we can go ahead and make sure that we're doing the same thing here. There we go. So now we're passing the flow lines to the um, to the geometry as an actual cost and to the color, which means that now if we look at our result, go make sure we've got a nice clear preview again. Okay, what's going on here? Color. Oh, this color doesn't. Need to, that was the issue. My mistake. Accordingly, so there we go. That was why I had the color there that I forgot. So scatter there, have a little look at the result. And now we're starting to get somewhere uh, really interesting for our river simulation. So if I go and increase the number of scatter points to say 20 or even 50, you see how just how nice a result we get. And uh, that's starting to look pretty good. So we've got our rivers, we've got our animal paths and our human trails as well. So there we go. Let's merge all of these together. Going to make sure that we keep the color of the rivers. Let's make sure that we also have a color for the animal trails that's clearly identifiable. And let's make sure we have a color for the man-made paths. Let's now look at all of that together. Okay. And I think the animal trails are a little bit hard to see, so here we go. And you can see how you can very quickly start to sort of generate this uh, really intricate network of different kinds of paths from one simple tool. So let's take these over to Unreal. Uh, we're gonna look at how do we generate splines, uh, Unreal Landscape splines, and then we're going to uh, look at other ways to get sort of this spline tool working, uh, finally, <laughs> inside of Unreal.